I will introduce myself. I am Jim Gustafson, professor of psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin Medical School, giving my 20th of 36 lectures. Today's lecture is called The Details in Delivering Our Patients, The Immense Delicacy of Dogberry. This is my second lecture of the doing psychiatry like obstetrics. I admit I am proposing a more ambitious, even more heroic potential for psychiatry. That is more like saving people. More exactly, it is about knowing how to help our patients save themselves. It would be a kind of subspecialty of psychiatry, more like obstetrics than the internal medicine that it has become in its reliance on psychopharmacology and behavioral programs. Something more extraordinary is possible. It depends, however, for its validity on an exquisite feel for details that have immense consequences for, cap for either for ill in a, in, a, in a flow of ill wind, the patient gets captured in a kind of hell. And in a, in a, in a, in a wind that's more like well-being for delivering the patient back to a fruitful existence. So this lecture in obstetrics is about delivering the patient from ill wind and it's the pathology to being well which is a different kind of flow. All of these lectures are about uh, this obstetrical potential. This lecture will take up two particular capacities that are vital to this kind of delivering by acute attention to crucial details for ill or for well. It is something like what Arthur Conan Doyle pictured in his character of Sherlock Holmes which you may not know that Doyle was, Arthur Conan Doyle was a medical student in Edinburgh and under a great doctor of details named Joseph Bell. Uh, Bell became Holmes in the stories. The two great capacities for detail that deliver the patient that I will discuss today are these. A, a capacity to read the details of walking into great danger as into the mouth of a leviathan or a killer whale in the Bible. B, the capacity to read people who have too high an opinion of themselves and deserve a much lower one. You don't know anyone like that. And vice versa, to read people who have too low an opinion of themselves and deserve a much higher one. I begin with my favorite teacher of these capacities, who is also my favorite comic character in Shakespeare. And I hope you won't run away when I mention Shakespeare. I like to teach six lines of Shakespeare and, and convince you that you can handle it. Uh, this is uh, Dogberry, the constable uh, in Much Ado About Nothing. Then I will take my pair of dreams that illustrate how I borrowed Dogberry's talents for myself. I am Dogberry. Well, well, my patient last week said I had a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> and, but Doyle borrowed his ca capacities from his professor of medicine. I borrowed mine from Dogberry, also known as Shakespeare. I will illustrate how our patients can borrow this pair of talents from us, for you, for yourselves. Or more exactly, how they can be helped to see they already have the talents. That's stronger. So Dogberry and Much Ado About Nothing. How are we doing? We're right on time. So Dogberry is the constable or sheriff for the governor of Messina in this drama. The governor is in serious distress about the reputation of his daughter, which has been ruined by um, fi fiction, by slander. And he sets Dogberry and his associates to find out the malefactors, that's what they call them. And Dogberry and his friends love the word malefactors. 
they get a little carried away. He has two associates, Virgis, who's the head, head of the borough or the head of the village, and Sexton. And they seem to be hilariously incompetent from the moment they open their mouths. Um, you, you could watch this in Kenneth Branagh's film version of Much Ado About Nothing. You can get it on DVD. Michael Keaton plays Dogberry. He just is perfect. So the scene where Dogberry, Burgess, and the Sexton convene to begin their proceedings is Act 4, Scene 2, lines 1 to 6. So you can handle six lines of Shakespeare, right? Um, they, they, they uh, seem to get every word wrong in, this, in these six lines. Uh, but they have not. Every wrong word here, and I'll, point, and I'll point them out so that you see them, every wrong word they use is a parody of the nobles that have got it seriously wrong. This trio actually knows what's going on unconsciously, but they seem not to, they seem not to know consciously what they're doing. That's why they're so funny. And uh, this, they're just like our patients, who unconsciously know what's going on, but don't know that they know. And that's the strength of this whole proceeding. Here are the lines. Dogberry is our whole dissembly appeared. Dissembly? He means assembly, right? So he's, all, he's already off on the wrong foot. Burgess, oh, a stool and a cushion for the sexton. Sexton, which be the malefactors? Dogberry, Mary, that I am and my partner. He, he means a benefactor, you see. He's confused. <laughs> Burgess, nay, that's certain. We have the exhibition to examine. He means commission to examine, but exhibition, he means, you see? Everything's wrong. Now, I will come back to this immense delicacy here in a minute. I just uh, want to explain my use of that arresting phrase, immense delicacy, and the, and, which is the purpose of the lecture. I want to explain the most important thing in the world to me and to some few others which can only be gotten across in the details, which turn out to be both immense and delicate, simultaneously. It sounds like an oxymoron, and it is, for something to be that vast and that infinitesimal. Now, you already have several before you. When Dogberry says, is our whole assembly appeared, he would seem to mean assembly, and thus getting it wrong. Yes and no because they have the exhibition to examine, which seems wrong again, putting exhibition for commission. Now, gather your wits up here. Now, here's the hardest part of the lecture. But Dogberry and his partners are full of, are full of dissembly in their assembly, and they're full of, of the exhibition of themselves um, in their commission. And this is the, what the play is about, because all the noble people in the play are full of, de of deceiving, dissembly, and they're full of ex exhibiting themselves all the, all the time. <laughs> so these guys are kind of the, sh you know, the, the shadow of the same thing. So dissembly and exhibition do get in the way of sound judgment. That's Shakespeare's serious point. And of course, this Globe Theater is the very world for us to be continuously alert to the tiniest movement. There's that tiny business in a word. So those with the commission to examine may turn out to be the malefactors indeed, not the benefactors. Now we, now we get serious with a pair of dogberry dreams of mine. How are we doing? Five more minutes? I should be able to do it. This is a dream of myself at age eight and a half. And um, I've been arguing in the, that in the last several lectures that the flow is the romance of a child in a lifeline in which he or she entrusts his or her total being. It is a line taken on faith by the child from an admired adult, but it always gets in danger at some point or at many points and needs to be reconceived. There's an obstetrical metaphor. William James called it a second birth applying to himself when he was in his late 20s, first of all. So let's look at the whiteboard to the left-hand side of it, and you'll see a diagram of, of the first of two dreams. I'm in a port city on a pier for ferry boats, and that's next to a slip in which a huge ferry boat seems to be docked. As I look through the portals, you see that's me in blue there, standing on my tiptoes, I see it is no ship at all 
but a huge killer whale that is pulled into the slip in place of the ferry boat. I take a tiny house nail out of my pocket and prick the killer whale through a porthole pointing in the direction of the sea. The whale solemnly and slowly begins to move back out to sea. Speaking of, of delicacy with immense, it has immense force. Such an immense delicacy of a, of a leviathan, of a killer whale, set in motion by the prick of a boy's nail, no pun intended, uh, as he seems to have reconceived his own lifeline, knowing when to walk into something and when to send it on its way to sea. Second dream now, uh, coming around to where we began with Dogberry, I dreamt of my becoming him after I read that much ado about nothing for the umpteenth time, in which he and his partners do their work. Now let's look at the second, the whiteboard again, Ed, and that's the drawing on the right. And we'll be finished shortly. So I dreamt I was on a steep slope. You see that black line, and has a, and I, on a soccer field in my house at Harvard, which was Lowell House, um, which is also a soccer field called a pitch. Um, and it's swarming with players in front of me. That's me, the blue guy there. And I'm sitting on a brown chair, uh, like the one actually in my study for the last 30 years. And it has a marvelous property. The property is that the chair will slide up and down that black slope. Um, if someone, something comes at me that estimates itself too low, that's the orange line at the bottom, I just lift it up and send it off at a higher, up high, right? And if it comes in too high, like that purple line up high, somebody has too big an idea of themselves. I take them down the slope and send them down below. All right, we can come back from that and we'll finish the lecture. Now I'll explain to you what this means clinically for you. Again, delicate moves with an immense range, for I can take all, on all comers if I can estimate them justly and thus help them to estimate themselves. Very dogberry. He would have seemed to be a mere constable, but he was actually a religious judge in his, in his seat of judgment, in the flow of, mo of the moment, on the field, on the soccer field of nature. You need to hear every phrase which is likely to have a word reversed like benefactor into malefactor. Some people think they're great benefactors. They actually have to be brought down the slope and sent out for the malefactors that they are. So. The last, of the last couple of minutes of the lecture, each one of my patients acts like Dogberry himself or myself in my dreams. He or she naively walks into a ferry boat that is really a killer whale. And he or she naively takes persons with high opinions of themselves as deserving it. This is the captivity of our patients and of ourselves consciously, but unconsciously. Huh? They know better. I deliver them from their naivete by finding in them already two capacities to prick the killer whale with an ordinary house nail and send it out to sea. Secondly, to sit in judgment themselves and bring those too high down low and those too low up high. Sounds very biblical, Pam. It is. I remind you of a patient that I mentioned here a number of times just to, so, you, so you know exactly how I mean this clinically. You remember the patient who was, had the dream of sit standing on a chair with, a, with a, a noose around her neck in the company warehouse, uh, which she was supposed to step off the chair and, and just be a good girl and go along with strangulating herself, which would be very convenient for the company that if she lost her voice and didn't object and the same for her family. But in, and this is all of patients, all the patients of Breuer and Freud had self-strangulation. That's what they called it. It's still the case. But this is the flow of pathology along the first line of sight. Rather, she takes, she takes, the, she takes the noose off her neck. And she takes all of the harsh judgments of her work as undeserving and lifts herself up far above them. Just like Dogberry and myself in the chair of judgment, this is the second kind of flow, the flow of well-being for her in a second line of sight delivered from the first line of sight of the flow 
of the pathology. Thank you.